welcome back. So you've made it to chapter 3. This is instrumentation. So in this chapter we're going to be going over the different uh, instruments that we use in the laboratory, some different adjustments you might have to make, and troubleshooting that comes with everything that goes into a histology lab in order to either analyze our slides to, to make sure that uh, all of our procedures are working well, or running a microtome, or an embedding setter, or a processor. So uh, let's get started. So the first thing I want to go over is microscopes. Chances are, when you're cutting at some point, you're going to want to check your work before it's stained. Uh, let's say if you're look, cutting a skin, you might want to look at the epidermis to make sure that you've gotten everything. And the best way to check that and the best amount of detail is in a light microscope. The way the light microscope works is light is shined from the bottom, typically, of a specimen, and the light goes through that specimen through an objective and then through the eyepiece or the ocular. And at that point, things are magnified through whatever the magnification is of the objective, and is also magnified by whatever the ocular lens magnification is. And that's how you know what your magnification is. That's how you can calculate it is by multiplying what your ocular lens magnification is. It's typically 10, sometimes 5 on a student microscope, and 15 for some of the higher end oculars, but typically 10. And then you multiply that 10 by whatever your objective is currently. So if it's a 45, that's a 45 times 10 be 450 magnification. Now there's a few factors to keep in mind when using a light microscope. One is your magnification. But there's also resolving power. So the ability of a microscope to make things look bigger is magnification. But if you just zoomed in on something, let's say, think about like an old, old uh, cell phone camera picture, right? And if you just keep zooming into it, it just gets blurry eventually, right? And that that's a that would be a microscope without any resolving power. So things get bigger, but you can't actually tell what everything is. It's all blob. The resolving power is the ability to tell between the two objects are actually separate. So it's kind of the clarity of, of the microscope. One thing to, to keep in mind when you're using a light microscope, this is a trick that I use. If you're looking for epidermis, you can actually take the condenser, which is typically located right above the, the light bulb, and that tends to take the light and put it into a a singular spectrum, so it kind of concentrates it. Uh, and so what you do is you actually flip that down. You let the light bulb just kind of disperse and let all, all the different uh, all the different sources of light just kind of bounce around. And what that does is it makes it it provides a little bit more contrast based on density. So when you're looking at an epidermis, and you flip down the condenser, then you're going to see things kind of by density, and it just helps you see the epidermis a little bit easier. An issue that you might run into with a light microscope is when you go to change the objectives, that you have to do a ton of adjusting. So when you're going from low and mean to high, uh, the specimen doesn't stay in focus. And at that point, your microscope does not have par focality. And that's all that is, is the ability for a person to go from one objective to the other without having to readjust. And how you change that is by changing the position of the objectives themselves. So those can be adjusted, but it, it's a lot of fine adjustments that go, go into that. And sometimes things get bumped and you have to redo that process. Another instrument that is used routinely in histology is a polarizing scope. Now we typically don't use a separate scope for this. The way that you take a light microscope and use it as a polarizing scope is by placing a polarizing film over the light bulb and then one in between the eyepiece and the specimen. Typically there's a little slot up there right around the neck that you can just kind of slide the polarizer into. And then you'll rotate the one in the bottom, the one over the light piece, until you, until you see what you want to see. So what are you going to see? Well, when we're looking for something that uh, under a polarizing scope typically is something with birefringence. And what that means is when the light hits it, it tends to bounce in a couple of different directions. 
and when it does that it, it's kind of shiny on one of those ways and if you're lined up directly from one of those planes it looks very very shiny and typically has a certain color associated with it so what a polarizer does is it kind of looks at things in slices of light and so when you're rotating it it might line up with this one and not this one and nothing else around it so this one lights up really really brightly and that's all it really is you're really just looking at different planes of light you're kind of cutting the light into little slices and you're looking at very specific ones by doing that you can isolate things that have birefringence uh, something you might use this in is a Congo Red so when you stain something for Congo Red the amyloid has kind of an apple green birefringence and so when you look at another polarizer you can tell that you did the stain right another type of microscope or modification of a light microscope is phase contrast and that's typically used to look at unstained slides uh, and it's kind of what we do with that trick that I talked about where we remove the condenser, but in this case you put something else there and another piece add, is added on to make it a true phase contrast microscope. But it's not something we really use in histology aside from that little trick for, uh, for looking for epidermis. Dark field is another type of microscopy that we don't really use in histology so much. Uh, what that is, is it's taking all of the things that you would see in light microscopy, so any direct light that's coming through the specimen, along with any dyes and all of that, uh, it's going to exclude all of that. And it's only going to take light that goes in at an oblique, so kind of at a, a weird angle. And it's going to take all of that in, and it's going to look directly at only that light. What that allows it to do is it excludes anything, so it kind of gets rid of some of the junk. Uh, it only shows anything that says no air bubbles, crystals, or red blood cells typically are excluded this way. So it's kind of a way of filtering things. Uh, once again, they don't really use it in uh, histopathology all that often. Another technique that typically a histotech will have to prepare for rather than actually perform is immunofluorescence studies. So in an immunofluorescence study they're going to use a special microscope. It uses a halogen lamp which produces UV rays. And the reason you use UV rays is because when things autofluoresce and you hit them with a UV ray they kind of glow. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a sort of a glowing object in the field. And the way that we get this is we, we attach some antibodies that are, are programmed to attack whatever we're looking for and then we attach a fluorescent molecule to those antibodies and we hit that molecule with UV light, it fluoresces. Okay. That, that molecule is typically Fight C and Fight C stands for fluorescent thiocyanate. This said typically as a zootech, you're really not going to have to worry about actually performing this. Uh, a lot of places have their own flow labs, which tend to specialize in this kind of thing. Though we will have to worry about making sure that our tissue is ready for immunofluorescent studies, if that's something we're going to need. But microscopy is electron microscopy. Now, what makes electron microscopy different is the huge difference in magnification and resolution. And how that is achieved is by using an electron gun as opposed to a light source and a light microscope and the way that you make an electron gun is by using a tungsten filament and what that does is it produces electrons at a much shorter wavelength than visible light now because we're getting rid of visible light we don't have color and that's why electron microscopy slides are black and white because nothing reflects there's nothing to reflect there in terms of a visible spectrum. So if it's on visible light, how do we see it? Well, when the electrons are, are being shot out of the gun and bounce off of the specimen and they hit a screen instead of your, your eyeballs, and that screen tends to, tends to be uh, uh, <clears throat> interpreted by a computer of some sort, and then you actually see the results on a computer screen rather than a microscope eyepiece. In addition to electron microscopy, the, the electrons are getting kind of forced through, just like the visible light would be. 
and it's either picking up on the things that are being deflected or the things that are being transferred between the through the specimen. And so it's working the same way as visible light, where the light goes through and you see what comes through the other end. Now in scanning, electron microscopy, we're only seeing the things that are deflected. And the way that that works is we kind of see anything that bounces and we see the depth at which it bounces, which is important because it kind of acts like a, like a sonar in a way, like on a ship, where it calculates how long it takes for things to come back. And by doing that, we get a 3D image. The only drawback with a scanning method is that there's no penetration, so you can't really see any of the ultrastructures unless they're already exposed to the surface. But the, yeah, these things are, are incredibly useful. Uh, if you've never seen a, an image of a scanning electron microscope, please take a look. There's plenty online. A lot of folks use it to look at insects. So you can see uh, like a, the face of a fly or, or something. And it, it's just incredible if you've never seen one. The next instrument that we want to look at is the microtome. And the microtome is pretty unique to histology. I don't know if there's another industry that uses microtomes unless you want to include the Dali slicer which is kind of the same thing. So let's talk about the different types of microtomes. For one, we have the rotary, which is what you typically think of when you think of a microtome. It's the thing that you crank with your hand or with a motor, and as you crank, the chuck goes up and down, and each time it goes up, it comes uh, forward a little bit, and the amount that comes forward determines the thickness of your sections. And each time it comes forward, it hits a razor blade as a specific angle, and it kind of scrapes off a section. If you're using paraffin for your embedding medium, then every time you cut, the next section is adhered to it, and it pushes the first one out, and so you get a ribbon. And that's essentially rotary microtomes, but there's a lot that goes into them in terms of adjusting and making sure that your sections aren't just present but they're acceptable. Now on the other end of things, in terms of microtomy, we have the sliding microtome, which is the opposite. So in our rotary microtome, the chuck with the paraffin block moves, right, and the blade stays stationary. A sliding microtome, it's the opposite. So we have our block that kind of stays in place, and when the, the you actually move the blade itself horizontally, so you just kind of push it across, or there's probably another mechanism there to, to move it automatically. But so the blade moves across, and as it comes back, it completes the cycle and it takes a section. And then there's kind of a, a screw apparatus underneath the block itself. So in this case, the block still advances, just like in a rotary microtome. But, but that's the only movement that the block ever has. And this is typically used for really, really big paraffin blocks or sometimes, or also things that are embedded in soloidin. The next piece of equipment is something that I haven't experienced before. It's a clinical freezing microtome. And so what it is, is it's kind of like a sliding microtome, except there it's portable. So it's something you can kind of use uh, as needed. You can kind of clamp it down to a tabletop. And the truck itself is attached to a supply of carbon dioxide, which keeps it super cold. And now, so when you put your block of, of uh, frozen tissue on it, it stays cold, and the, once again, as a sliding microtome does, the knife moves rather than the, the chuck. And after the knife moves past it, the chuck goes up on the core screw, but that is the limited amount of movement that it has. It just advances. The chuck itself doesn't actually move back and forth during a cycle. Now let's get into some of the specific details in microtomy. We'll start with microtome blades. Now, histology has been performed for at, at least a century, if, if not for more, and since then we've had some advances. So early on in histopathology, we've used blades that need to be sharpened. Uh, so we do not have disposal blades like we did today. And since the disposal blades have been brought in, the steel blades that they're big and heavy apparently, they had to be sharpened, I, I want to say daily, but um, they, were, they were a huge pain and, and not great for the amount of volume that we cut today. And so we're not going to get really into how to sharpen them and, and all the things that go into that. So you have your microtome blade, 
Uh, you want to make sure that your ducts, which you will readily be able to see in your sections. So if you get a line going vertically down, typically you have a defect in your blade. So the section might start to compress if the blade gets too dull. Now first, let's talk about clearance angles and bevel angles. These can be kind of confusing. When you think of a bevel angle, that's actually the angle that the blade itself has. So the bevel angle does not change unless you're changing the blade to a different type. But typically you don't change the bevel angle yourself. That's just on the blade. The clearance angle, on the other hand, is something that you can change. So here's your bevel angle. This is your blade. There's your chuck. Your bevel angle is right here. So it's the actual angle of the, the microtone blade itself. And right here is your clearance angle. So in this example, the blade is straight up. So the angle between the blade and the block is zero. That is a clearance angle of zero here. So as we move our blade this way, in increasing the clearance angle, so let's say five degrees or whatever, then that increases the clearance angle right here. So typically, you don't want to max or minimize your clearance angle. Most laboratories will have a standard that you want to set yours towards. Anywhere between five, maybe four and seven is pretty good. I tend to keep mine at five just because that's how things work in our laboratory best. But you'll find that sometimes you're going to run into tissue that maybe needs a flat or a clearance angle. Uh, sometimes certain fatty tissues cut better at different clearance angles. You can kind of mess around with it a little bit. But always make sure that when you leave a microtome, it is at whatever clearance angle that your laboratory has deemed to be optimal. Just to make sure that everything cuts the same when anybody else uses that microtome. That is to say that when we're getting a section, you have to remember that it's not really cutting the block necessarily, where the blade isn't coming down at the same angle, well, the block isn't coming down at the same angle as the blade and then taking it off at that angle, it's actually kind of scraping it a little bit. And that's what gives us our sections. So if we put it at a, an exact angle, which would almost be impossible, let's just say we could. If we did that, then you get one section and that'd be it. Because you can't really get a ribbon that way if it's not given something to kind of sit on. And so we kind of have to give in to that a little bit. And depending on how what the angle is, depends on how much it's scraping compared to how much it's actually cutting. And you need a little bit of both in there in order to get an optimal section. So with that being said, you could think of cutting a paraffin block to being kind of like if you've ever seen somebody scrape uh, cold stone ice cream, that kind of thing, it's kind of like that. It's a little bit more like that, where the blade is hitting the paraffin, and it's getting under, optimally, a layer or in between layers of paraffin crystals. So you're just kind of taking a layer of the block off. You're not really cutting into it, you're just kind of lifting it and separating in between that layer, and hopefully picking up the tissue if it's fixed properly and, and infiltrated well, then you're getting that associated layer of the, the paraffin and the specimen. When we think of it like that, it makes macrotomy seem a little bit more perilous, right? It's not like cutting with scissors. It, it doesn't always cut exactly where you want it to. You're kind of relying on the paraffin and the specimen to behave and to stay in that one layer that you've chosen you want to cut. And that's how we get a lot of our artifacts. So let's say the blade is coming along and it hits something really hard, a calcification. So what that's going to do is the blade is actually going to hit that calcification and go into a different layer and hopefully go back down into the layer you wanted it to be in. It's going to be kind of forced down. So it skips a layer and it has to go right back in and pick up the rest of it. Well, typically it doesn't get the whole way back in. It's just going to keep moving into a different layer, and that's why you get a knife line when you hit a calcification. So your blade has essentially gone in one layer and hopped up into a different one and kept going. And it's also dull once it hits that calcification. So you're in the wrong layer and you have a dull blade, and that's how you get a knife line. And the way that you tell whether a knife line is caused by a calcification or it's by a defect in the blade 
possibly from a previous calcification, is where the line starts. So if the line goes the whole way through the block, that means that it has been dull and moving between layers through the whole section, meaning that there is a defect in your blade. Now, if the line starts somewhere in the middle of the block, that means it has hit something in the block, has moved, but the defect is not on the blade yet. Another thing that might occur is holes in your section. And this can be kind of tricky because you don't always see them at microtomy. And so sometimes you don't even know they're there until a pathologist sends it back for recut. And how this happens is if you are too aggressive with your facing, maybe you go in too deep facing it too fast. So if you're facing your block and it's just crunchy and it's all over the place and it's really messy, then what's happening is every time that blade hits, it's actually going in between layers again. So we're getting that, that vibration where it's picking up that one layer and it's going to another one, kind of like when we hit our calcification or had a knife line. And when you go take a section off of that, then the section is coming in and out of layers as well. And so you end up getting holes where there's nothing. So it's taking that one layer and while there wasn't anything here anymore, you dug in too deep. So you kind of get holes in your section. Let's talk about the effects of that clearance angle for a second. If you're cutting and you're either missing sections in between rotations, or maybe the section is actually lifting off as the block comes back up, then your clearance angle is probably too steep. Uh, on the other hand, if you're getting a lot of compression, and then chances are that it's too flat. Next artifact we want to talk about is washboarding, which is a lot like hitting calcifications, but very, very tiny ones. So imagine the blade is going through the block and it's kind of going in and out of those layers, but not completely in and out, we're not getting any tissue, but you're kind of getting too much tissue and then not enough, and then too much and then not enough. So it's kind of vibrating as it goes to the tissue. And when you do that, then it looks terrible on the stain because the thick sections get more stain and the thin ones don't get enough. This can be caused by a lot of things. Typically, you want to go to your microtome and make sure everything's tight for one. So tighten up any kind of adjustments, any of the knobs. Make sure that your blade is new. If it's doing this, try replacing the blade. Also, you want to check how far the chuck has come out. So a lot of times you can adjust how far your chuck extends from the microtome. And as it extends farther out, it vibrates when, when it hits the blade. It tends to wobble. So you want to get that as close to the microtome as possible so you eliminate that wobble. So move your entire block assembly as close to the microtome as you can when you start. That way, the arm doesn't come out as far. It doesn't get wobbly on you. And if all that all else fails, then sometimes you might have to change your clearance angle to a bit more of a steep one, uh, just just for that specimen, because that that higher angle, or that lower angle rather, just causes a little bit less vibration as it's going through. But just remember, it might end up pulling that section off if you're trying to get a serial section. So you might have to get just a single section on something. Maybe it's a uterus, or maybe it's just something that's just kind of cutting weird. Then you might have to get that one section and take it and put it on your water bath. Sure, that that one section is on a thick section because when you're getting that washboarding, a lot of times you're going to get thick and thin entire sections. So make sure whatever you pick up is not a thick or a thin section; it's a good section. Typically, you can tell that by how opaque or translucent the paraffin or the specimen is. The next artifact we're going to look at is micro shatter, which is kind of like a washboarding, but just on a smaller scale. Typically, we see this on biopsy specimens. Uh, sometimes those biopsy specimens are not processed well, and that can lead to over dehydration, which leads to shatter no matter how you cut them. Though sometimes it can happen at microtomy just because of how fast we're cutting them. Sometimes, you know, maybe you have a huge workload and you're just trying to get these biopsies out and you're cutting, 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 and you don't even notice, but you got some really dry sections or you're just cutting them just so fast that the blade is just kind of vibrating like crazy as it goes through it. Or maybe it's compressing it just enough to give it that chatter look. And it just, it makes them almost unreadable for the pathologist. That being said, how fast should you cut? Typically, it's recommended to, you're supposed to have one revolution per second. 
Now, some folks like to be fast on the recovery stroke and then kind of slow down as they take the section itself. That's always a good practice for me. Uh, sectioning speed will also change depending on the type of specimen. Every specimen is different. I've, I've noticed that some things cut better if you're going through it very, very slowly. And some things actually cut better if you cut through it really fast. Biopsies tend to be somewhere in the middle, so if you can do them at about one revolution a second, that's great. If you have a hard time maintaining that, if you have an automatic microtome, set it and just time at what speed it is one second or one revolution per second and just hit that paddle and let it do it for you. Uh, the automatic function is also great for eliminating a lot of these artifacts because it keeps a constant speed as it's cutting. And what that does is it keeps you from, from one, panicking on hard tissue. <laughs> so sometimes a lot of us will stutter as we go through hard tissue because we're anticipating that chunk, that, 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 that bad sound that goes through it. Or maybe we hit the resistance and we slow down and then we speed up a little bit to make up for it. The automatic microtome is not going to do that. It's going to be a constant speed through the entire thing. And it just lowers the vibration of the blade some. So that can increase your, the quality of your tissue. But of course, there's also a safety concern with that, which is understandable to worry about. Uh, so with automatic microtome, it's, it doesn't stop until you tell it to stop. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Another artifact you might run into is thick and thin, which we kind of talked about with washboarding. It's essentially washboarding that happens instead of within the t section, happens one section at a time. So I have a thick section and then a thin section, and a thick one. A lot of times this happens when the microtome isn't adjusted tightly, so you want to make sure that everything is tight on it if that happens. Though I've seen it happen on microtomes where there's an internal component that actually falls out of adjustment. Uh, there's like a, a set screw in, in, inside the actual microtome and you'll have to get a technician to come out and look at that. You're cutting and it's just mushing up right on the knife blade. That's called compression. Sometimes compression happens when a knife has become dull, so that's an easy fix. It's so usually the first thing I do is change the blade. It can also happen if your knife tilt is too flat, so you might have to increase, you might have to decrease your angle there. Also, compression can happen if the block isn't chilled enough. So it's kind of one of those things, a lot like the washboarding, where you kind of have to look at everything and change one thing at a time. Try taking a section. Okay, you know, it's not that. Check it out a thing. And eventually you'll figure it out. Uh, compression is, is very rarely something that uh, can't be avoided. All this being said, keep in mind that even if the section doesn't look perfect right off the microtome, you can flatten out some of it on the water bath. Sometimes it takes a few seconds. Sometimes it takes uh, up to 30 seconds to get some of the wrinkles out, but it's worth it. It's always worth getting that perfect section because even though a defect might look small, that defect could hide the one thing that that pathologist was looking for. The next piece of equipment is a cryostat, which we discussed in an earlier lesson, but we'll, we'll, we'll go back through it. So a cryostat is essentially a rotary microtome, typically, that's refrigerated. So it's in an enclosed container that you kind of have to open the lid to, and it's got that very low temperature so that the block that you're making, which is made with a medium that is warm, is liquid at room temperature, uh, stays solid. So it's frozen to keep your block frozen, which also keeps the specimen frozen. And so <clears throat> so when you're working on frozen, let's go over this again real quick, uh, somebody's going to cut it for you, they're going to gross it, they're going to give you the specimen, and then you take that and put it on a, an insert for the chuck. So you take your specimen, put a little bit of, we typically use, it's called OCT, put a little bit of that on that insert, put the specimen on that, put a little more of the OCT over top, and that's kind of making your block, okay? So your block is permanently attached to that insert, okay? There's not a removable block in this case, it's just that little insert. You take that insert and put it onto a heat extractor, which makes it so that it becomes solid. So once it's solid, take it out of the heat extractor, put it into the chuck. Okay, so you're essentially ready to go, make sure everything's adjusted. And you're going to face it like you would a normal block. And then when you go to get a section, there's actually two ways to get a section. 
Uh, on my first laboratory, we never used an anti-roll plate, so we just used a paintbrush to kind of tease a section out, and we pick it up that way. Take a warm slide, pick up that section, and then go stain it. There's also an anti-roll plate that you can use, and what an anti-roll plate is, is it stops the section from rolling up when you cut it. So when you're cutting on a frozen section, it's not like a paraffin section where it kind of shoots the section towards you automatically. It, well, it kind of does but it tends to roll up instead of coming out flat. So what an anti-roll plate does is it catches the section as it's coming off the, the block and just keeps it under like a little piece of plastic and essentially forces it to stay flat. So it stops it from rolling and then once it's there, you just lift up that anti-roll plate and you have a section just sitting there on the, on the apparatus which you can pick up. So you can either use an anti-roll plate or use a paintbrush, either way, uh, frozen section is a lot of fun if you can get into it. Not all labs use their histotex for that. Sometimes the PAs do it. Sometimes the pathologists will do it. Um, but there's there's a lot of techniques that you pick up along the way. Sometimes you have to warm the block a little bit if it's not picking up correctly. Sometimes you have to super cool it with some liquid nitrogen. And it's it's a little bit more of a finicky way of getting sections. But you're also not cutting a hundred of them in a day usually so so yeah if, if you can get into a frozen room and take a few sections even if it's not something you routinely do in your lab try to it's a lot of fun we kind of already talked about processors in a previous chapter so we're going to skip that now we're going to go on to stainers so there are two types of stainers that you want to think about there's a linear and there's robotic so a linear stainer is a stainer that runs the slides through buckets at a constant rate. So let's say every bucket is, is 30 seconds, uh, but not every reagent needs 30 seconds or needs more than that. So what you have to do is set the timing to the least amount. So whatever reagent takes the least amount of time, that's how much time they spend in each bucket. So the slide goes into a bucket for the least thing and that pops out of there. Well, what about the things that need more than whatever that minimum time is? Let's say it's 30 seconds. So let's say you need something to be in there for a minute. Well, then you put two buckets. So 30 seconds, 30 seconds. That gives you a full minute of exposure. So linear stainers can be kind of a pain that way. They're kind of hard to, to set up if your staining procedure is complicated. But if it's a simple procedure, let's say for frozens, they can be really handy because they're very small and the maintenance is very easy. Things tend to work on a, a, a bike chain and a little motor. So it just kind of moves the slides up and down into the things. And uh, they can be very, very handy, especially in a small enclosure. Now a robotic stainer, on the other hand, tends to be very big because you have a robotic arm that is going to pick up a bunch of slides and put them where you tell them to put them. So this allows you to use very complicated staining schedules. It allows you to set times that are much more precise so that you don't have to have four buckets for something that needs two minutes to run. You just have one bucket and just leave it in there for two minutes. So they're very handy that way. A lot of places use robotic stainers for the main stainer and use linear stainers for kind of specialty areas. Our next piece of equipment is the cover slipper. So a lot of laboratories, including the one that I started in, didn't have an automatic cover slipper. So we were cover slipping slides by hand, which if you have a couple hundred slides can be a lot of time for the text. So if you have a high workload or maybe just not a lot of text, say an automatic cover slipper is a great thing. They tend to come in two varieties. Uh, one uses film, so it uses kind of the same thing that, uh, that old movie film is made of. And it, puts it cuts it and puts it across the slide and uses some sort of solvent to melt it just enough so that it adheres to it. The other one is a glass cover slipper, which is essentially doing what we used to do by hand. And it just kind of takes a glass cover slip and just kind of slaps it on the, the slide with an adhesive. And then you get the same thing. Uh, I've heard mixed reviews about both. I've heard that the glass ones tend to break slides, but also our film cover slipper has broken slides just because of the way that it applies them. So it's ultimately up, up to the individual lab to decide uh, which one is most useful. Another piece of equipment is the flotation bath. 
So after you cut your section, you're going to float it out onto a flotation bath, typically filled with distilled water and heated to a temperature that is not quite the melting point of your paraffin, but just a few degrees lower. And what that does is it allows it to relax enough so that the wrinkles come out. And it allows it to adhere to the slide better when it's just a slightly melted but not too melted. So what happens if it's too cold? Well, chances are you're not going to lose any of the wrinkles and it's not going to adhere to the slide well. If it's too hot, on the other hand, it'll actually melt the paraffin and it'll cause everything to expand because it's being heated. And that can be really bad because your components of the tissue can separate. And pathologists want everything to be exactly as it was when it came out of the patient. So if things are being separated, then you're kind of distorting that image. Maybe your flotation bath is at a great temperature. Things aren't melting, but they're also getting the wrinkles out. But they're not adhering to your slides very well. So there's a few solutions to that. You can buy pre-treated slides, which have a permanent positive side, uh, so that the, the charge actually causes the section to stick automatically. Uh, maybe that's not a solution for you. You can add things to your flotation bath. You can add things like chromium potassium sulfate to the actual slides themselves. Uh, you can add polyolysine, or you, or you can add amino alkyl saline. And these are all things you just add to the slides themselves, which makes them a little bit easier to, to add the uh, slot, the sections to. You can also, as I said, add things to your water bath. You can add things like gelatin or auger. And those things tend to make the, the sections themselves a little bit more sticky. Now, any of these things can, can work, but you're also going to have some drawbacks. You might have some uh, different staining. Things might just look kind of generally dirty or messy on the sections. So you have to be careful with how much of these products that you use and make sure that there's kind of a balance there. So you're, you're picking up sections on your bath, everything's sticking well, but some of your slides look like the staining is, is not showing up in some places. Maybe it's kind of broken in the middle, uh, maybe some like you know, some dark pieces, but it's not like a washboard effect. So, so what's happening is you're probably getting air bubbles, or maybe you're getting floaters. So when you put things on the water bath, you have to make sure that one, just get rid of all the bubbles ahead of time. And a lot of times if you tap your water bath, that will cause the air bubbles to rise and you can kind of get rid of them that way. Take a piece of, of cloth and kind of just get rid of them. Uh, as far as floaters go, you kind of have to monitor that as you go. Certain sections tend to release more floaters. You can see them floating around. If that happens and you lose track of pieces, just go ahead and change the water bath. It, it's not worth risking something from one patient to transfer into another because sometimes you know a diagnosis might depend on seeing something that's not supposed to be there so you know you really don't want to influence a diagnosis by not cleaning your water bath one thing to note when we're working with our cassettes or our slides maybe you don't have a, a lab information system to to draw from and you're labeling things by hand just make sure that you have at least two patient identifiers on everything, either a cassette or a slide, so that those things can't be mixed up. Because the last thing you want is for one patient to be associated with another or one case be associated with another. So you want at least a name and an accession number on every slide or cassette. For some of our procedures, uh, especially at certain special stains or IHCs, we might have to check the pH of a solution. And what the pH is, is it's a way of reading the ion concentration of, specifically for hydrogen ions, or it's generally known as acidity or, or alkalinity. So as pH goes from 1 to 14, 1 being acidic, 14 being basic, 7 is neutral. So 7 is kind of like distilled water, 1 can be a strong acid and 14 can be a strong base like ammonia and as that hydrogen concentration changes the pH also changes so the electrode is kind of looking for the concentration of hydrogen ions so maybe this is your first time in a laboratory maybe you've never used a balance before what you're going to do when you need to measure something out by weight is you want to take your container you're going to put something in because you don't really put the th things directly onto the balance
because they can kind of contaminate the area and you kind of add weight and things can mix. You don't want to do that. You want to get some sort of weigh boat, which is typically a piece of plastic that you can put a substance in and then weigh it that way. It keeps the area clean. So you want to take the weigh boat that you're going to use, put it on the, the balance, go ahead and turn it on, and hit tear. And what tear is, is essentially sets the balance to zero. So it's saying that whatever's on there is just going to say, this is our zero. This is where we're going to start measuring. So your weigh boat is not part of that. So anything you add to that weigh boat is going to be measured. So that way you don't have to worry about measuring how much the weigh boat weighs. It's just going to ignore that weight. So if you need five grams of something, you tear it with your weigh boat on it, and then just keep adding until it hits five grams, until you have exactly five grams of whatever you're weighing. Let's talk about pipetting for a second. Uh, I feel like this shouldn't have to be said, but do not mouth pipette ever. It's bad. It's dangerous. Do not put your mouth on anything in, in the lab ever, especially the pipettes. Okay, always use a bulb or use a micro pipetter, which tends to have its own uh, trigger on it. So, and when you're drawing something, make sure that nothing gets into whatever your bulb or you're not overdrawing on the micro pipetter because if any solution gets in the apparatus itself so the bulb or the micro pipetter then that just contaminates the whole thing okay they're, they're incredibly hard to decontaminate so make sure you're paying attention to your levels also take a look at the tip when you're when you're drawing make sure you're completely submerged in the solution because if you draw any air then that air might get trapped in the bottom, which is going to affect the volume, which is going to throw off your measurement. Now, granted, if you get some in there, and you might be able to tap it out, but just, just avoid that if possible, and just make sure the tip is completely submerged in whatever you're trying to draw. The last little thing to talk about is quality control. We want to make sure we log everything. So anything that happens at laboratory, remember that you're, you're working in either a hospital or a research lab, whatever, things have to be documented so that every change that happens can be linked to any problem that happens later. So if something bad happens, we know the exact condition of the lab when it happened, we know any changes that we made so that we can trace that problem to whatever changes just occurred. So document everything, make sure if there's problems, see if you can do it, change it, and we have problems see if you can fix them in-house it's a lot cheaper usually a lot of places have service contracts though so if you have a problem that you can't fix in-house absolutely get a hold of somebody get a hold of your, your supervisor manager whoever see if you have a service contract for whatever it is is acting up and get somebody out there as soon as possible never try to fix something that you're completely inept at because if you break it more then it's gonna be harder to fix but also, there's ways of voiding warranties on things if you work on them in a way that you're not authorized to do. So, make sure everything's in working order always. Keep track of your data, keep track of your reagents, make sure nothing's expired. That sort of thing can keep a laboratory running well. And that's the end of the chapter. So you made it. We're, we're going to be moving on to safety next, which is really dry. And I know the past few chapters are also pretty dry. But it's okay. Once we get through that, then we're going to have safety, we're going to have lab math, which is also hard. But then after that we get into staining, which uh, tends to be everybody's favorite thing. So it's going to be nuclear staining, special stains, and we're kind of going to go from there. I would say, if you've gotten to this point, keep going until you get through safety and get through lab math. If you can get through all of that, get all that down pat, and kind of section that off in, in your brain then it might be a little bit easier when we get into staining because once we get into it that's basically it everything is, is staining for the rest of the book so just kind of try to compartmentalize all this information up to lab math including lab math and then we'll go from there and as always if you have any feedback please let me know if there's anything i can change about the videos or add to it if you have questions reach out to me and have